Welcome everyone to our first session on uh, pivoting to online teaching. Uh, we appreciate the sort of uh, interest that groups have in trying to make sense of what does this mean in the long run in terms of teaching and learning practices and what kind of impact that might have on what you're currently doing. And some of you may be faculty who are trying to get caught up to speed and other of you are going to be individuals who are currently uh, helping assist others to go online. Some of you may be fully up to your eyeballs with extensive online experience and you're, you're just joining in perhaps more so as an opportunity to help others uh, make that transition as well and contribute expertise that you have throughout the course. So thanks for joining us. You might have seen some of our quick introductions online that in the website that Matt's been working on. So uh, I'll drop a link in the chat in just a moment. So we'll, we'll share those with you so you can have a look at that. We have today, we've got two presentations. We're going to have Tanya Jusen from University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee and Matt Croslin from University of Texas at Arlington are going to provide a little bit of an overview of planning and designing to get into the space. This session is being recorded so we can share it with others uh, post-event because we pulled this together very quickly and hasn't had a chance to sort of make its way through uh, the people that may benefit from this particular conversation. This course does have a few different spaces. One is on the website. All the resources are freely open and available that Matt has uh, already started pulling together. The edX environment, the certificate edX has waived any fees affiliated with the certificate as well. So that'll give everyone an opportunity to at least dive into the edX environment. There's, there's no fee attached to it. Uh, even, you know, usually there's the audit is free, but in this case, uh, basically no, no fees attached to edX. So thanks to them for making that available. I'm going to pass it over to Justin, who has been setting up a lot of the work within the edX environment and some of you may be new to edX. So before we get going, I just want to be aware, make sure where if you're having some issues with bandwidth, feel free to kill the video uh, in case that's slowing bandwidth down for you. It may be an issue as you go forward. And as well, if you end up with um, any questions, feel free to drop them in the chat area while we're sort of having this conversation. So I'll just say hello into our chat so you can feel free to share any comments or questions you want there. Beyond that, uh, I'm gonna ask uh, Justin to give you a quick overview of how edX works, how it's structured. It'll be just a couple minutes and then both Tanya and Matt will do about a 10 minute discussion each. I'm gonna kill my video in case it impacts bandwidth, but for now, welcome all. Appreciate your interest here and look forward to uh, learning with you over the next few weeks. Justin, over to you. Okay, so just currently sharing my screen right now. Um, just a quick heads up when you enter the course, um, you will have, um, it, when you are in edX, um, you will see um, announcements at the, at the top here on your landing page. Um, so I actually currently don't have one of the um, updates up right now, but it did have one. Um, after you've uh, viewed it, um, it does go away. So just be aware of that. If you do um, need to access it again, just come over here to this updates button and that'll allow you to be able to see any prior ones that we had, including the course, so welcome that we had. Um, I sent the message out a little bit ago about the session today and about what George mentioned about um, basically having full access to the course. Um, a quick a quick um, disclaimer here is that um, you can still pay if you wanted to have like a certificate, but if you don't care about that at all and you just want to be able to get the content and participate in, 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 the, in the course itself too, um, you'll have full access to, to all the features in it. So, um, when navigating, um, to put the syllabus, uh, course help, things like that for easy access across the top, as well as a link to the page that George mentioned that, that Matt's been working really hard on to get squared away. Um, and so I did put, um, I did put um, a, uh, an iframe in here if you want to be able to kind of take a quick look at it, but um, it's probably best just to go to look at the actual web page and WordPress itself. Um, so we'll have different ways that we can interact in those spaces. We're gonna to try to keep it as, as close um, as we can between the two um, but, uh, modes. But um, anyway, just wanna make you aware of that. Um, if you haven't participated um, in an edX course before, there are discussion forums. Um, as you can see over here on the left side, um, we have these different forums uh, such as introducing yourself. Um, I have a little uh, share meme activity that I put in here around the, the fun, um, Great on lining, as George uh, coined it a few weeks, uh, I guess about a week ago. Um, and then just the, the different um, sessions. So including today, if you have anything that you'd like to share about this uh, session, um, 
if you want to do it during the, during the session itself, or if you want to do it at a later time, let's say you thought of some things um, and wanted to engage with some people as the week went along, um, this is the form which to do it. So you can access it through the discussions or through the course itself. So when you come down here, um, you'll see like the getting live sessions and say for Monday, here's what the one that's on, um, you could add a post in, in this space. So um, the best way to, to do the, the course tab is probably the best way to be able to navigate um, throughout all of it. Um, we do have some orienting materials um, and, and the help feature. We'll have some TAs that are gonna help us keep an eye on the help um, tab as well in the, in the forum, just to make sure that um, we can answer any questions that you might have. Um, please try to keep um, content in the different forums um, specific to the um, the topic, whatever the forum is. So if you need help with, with course content or activities, things like that, keep it in, in that one as opposed to maybe discussion about a certain topic because we might not be able to, to see everything all the time and be able to react quickly. So we'd appreciate that you uh, helping with that. And then if you want to, uh, if you're active on Twitter and you want to um, share some things, um, we encourage you to use the hashtag pivot online, um, especially um, I know George uh, mentioned um, if you are a little bit more of an experienced uh, online instructor, um, and we'd love to be able to hear some of the things that are working effectively for you. So um, please uh, use the hashtag, and um, if you can create a, a short video that uh, you can share with us, we would appreciate that. We'd love to curate some of these things and share it with others. So um, we have this space. The other one is, um, um, as, as I showed you in, in edX, this is the web page that Matt's been building out. So including all the Zoom sessions and, and other information here. Um, so we'd like to um, uh, you know, look at in terms of navigation on the top right. Um, we have week zero, we'll have weeks one through five as well um, on here. This week, um, again, is sort of like an onboarding time, um, but we thought that was really important to um, make sure that I'm sure at our university, I know Matt and I have been working with faculty all day long, uh, trying to help them move their courses online. And I'm sure that many others are, are doing the same. So we wanted to make sure that we provided some, some very practical the research informed ways to be able to, um, to be able to help out during this time as we're all kind of moving into the space. So I'm gonna stop sharing there. I see some chats uh, coming in. Um, yeah, no worries, no worries, Justin. Feel free. It's not related to. We're just sort of okay. around. So feel free to ignore that. Thanks, Justin, for that quick overview. Yeah, no worries. Uh, what we want to emphasize, I've said this in some of the intro videos, and others have mentioned this as well. As part of the goal here is, we want to focus on the research around teaching online, and we want to provide a level of support for you to make that transition. And that sometimes means a space where you can ask questions, where you can share a few ideas and so on. So we encourage you to use the discussion forums that Justin just addressed to drop in and uh, you know, share any outputs that you might want to have others comment on, or if there's something you're really grappling with and you're just not sure, how do I teach this? Or th that's part of the intent of that online forum. It is, as Justin noted, everyone's a little stressed and it's a not a, uh, willful intention to move online. You're being, in many cases, forced to go online. And so we wanna make as much of a research informed guidance on that as we can. Now to that end, we have uh, two individuals who know this topic very well. We'll kick off with, with Tanya to do some of, uh, sharing a little bit of the, the research in the background that she's familiar with in this area. She runs a, a distance uh, education research project and has been running, I think, for four years now, or maybe even longer, if I recall correctly. And so certainly uh, you won't find anyone who has better expertise or awareness of the dynamics uh, related to this environment. So Tanya, over to you. And by the way, if you have questions while Tanya is presenting, just drop them in the discussion forum uh, or in the chat area, and I'll uh, collect and direct to Tanya when she's finished. All right. Thanks, George. Yeah, we've been running the National Research Center for actually six years. Can you believe it? Time is moving fast. Um, I'm sharing some slides here that I put together quickly. This will be a brief presentation. The idea was for us to get this started early because we know everyone's trying to figure out how to plan for this remote teaching. Um, on the fly. And so we on the fly obviously are putting this course together to try to help some of you. Um, when we usually talk about online delivery, we think of this idea that we're not just putting out stuff online, that we're actually transforming our course for the online. So I think we'll be sort of walking a little bit between, you know, between these two sorts of things because we don't really have months to plan to redesign and effectively deliver our course online. So 
When pivoting to online, there are several areas that are normally included in your planning. This is just a nice visual of all of those different things normally that you plan for. And so um, we've got supporting students, redesigning your course, delivering content, developing activities, assessing your students, managing workload, and evaluating your course. So um, the first thing I should mention, if you haven't done so already, you should definitely check with the resources available for your institution. So you might have a center for teaching and learning or a center for digital teaching and learning or something like that. You might have some IT resources just so that you could see what's available for you there. Now, this identifying these areas started actually almost 20 years ago uh, from a group that was looking at one, how do we teach using technology and teach blended online, but also thinking about um, looking at the research that was out there that we could bring into this. We also were running grant projects and sort of experimenting with teaching blended and online. And uh, at the same time, there were there's research being conducted all over the country, including the UMass system, which resulted in what we know now as quality matters. And so these are really the areas that we pay attention to in order to ensure that we're delivering a quality experience to our students. And so I'm gonna just talk about a few of these today. Um, these we've developed over the years with me and my colleagues at the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee and um, have used to help support faculty actually at dozens of institutions. Based on some research that my colleagues and I at the Data Research Center recently did and put out in a publication in December that you can find in the online learning journal, is we found out there were a couple areas that were really important when we talk about impacting student outcomes. And those three areas are supporting students, redesigning your course, and content delivery. And so I wanna make sure to just, in the brief time that we have today, as you think about your planning, I want you to think about these three areas, um, you know, first. I know normally for a lot of folks who are teaching face-to-face, -face, immediately you're thinking about how do you deliver your content. I'm gonna take a little bit um, of a different angle there and start off with supporting our students, which is sort of usually an afterthought. But in this instance, students have high anxiety about the experience they're going through. And so I'm gonna ask um, to take a minute and to really think about your students. Now, um, when we think about supporting our students, I heard lots of people uh, on social media and other conversations and giving webinars more about the qualities that we should have as instructors right now. And there's a few of them that came up um, and these are empathy. So, you know, really putting ourselves in the shoes of our students and understanding sort of the anxiety and the nervousness that they're going, not only with what's going on in the world, but what's going on with their education here. Also the idea of expressing care. Uh, you know, we actually have research and others do like my colleagues, uh, Patsy Moskal and Chuck Zubin at the University of Central Florida, that actually showing concern and care for your students, um, knowing that their learning matters actually has a positive, statistically positive impact on their satisfaction with the course. I know at the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee, we're really emphasizing being flexible. I always say be forgiving of yourself and forgiving of your students when you're trying something new. I think this is a great case for that. Um, and also our research has shown when we're talking about courses is that really focus on clarity. So making sure that when you can, being as, as clear with your students so that it's reducing the amount of uncertainty. I'm thinking in my head of uncertainty reduction theory right now. But anyways, there are some areas that I identified from the research and I've referenced a couple of our studies here on the screen. We'll be sharing the slides and these resources and so forth online um, so that you folks don't have to jot them down, you'll have access to them. But I sort of identified the five areas that I felt that we should be thinking about and, and moving through to this. And so it was communication, orientation, expectations, technology and I can't see that. I wanna say it was accessibility. I have somebody's face over it. Yeah, accessibility. <laughs> All right, so the first thing um, I'm hearing from students is that they're very uncertain and, um, oh, there we go. I clicked ahead a little fast there. So that they're sort of very uncertain about what is going on. And so I think it's really important to um, immediately communicate with your students. Um, 
obviously I'm from the field of communication, so I think it's super important anyways. But I think right now it's really good to just acknowledge the situation that we're in. It's a big change for everyone. And just let them know that you're gonna work through this together. We do know through our research that faculty or that students want faculty and instructional staff to communicate with them. Frequently, they want timely feedback. So I really think it's good right away to make sure you're communicating with your students, let them know that you're working on planning for your remote uh, or their remote learning experience and, and get that stuff out to them as soon as possible and make sure that you're clear with them about the ways you'll be communicating to them how often and in the preferred methods i know obviously email is a standard institutional way you can also communicate through the announcements and a learning management system some folks like myself go as far to give students my cell phone number for text messaging and those sorts of things um, we know from the research that the more communication the usually less uncertainty people have about an experience of change and I think this is a great place to have it. We're going to talk about supporting students more as we move through but you're going to need to make sure to orient your students to the changes that are happening in your course as you're planning. You're going to need to be very clear about your expectations for what they should be doing and how they should be doing it and where they should be doing it. So you'll need to unpack everything probably much more than you ever have previously. Um, just a couple other things to touch on is technology and accessibility. Uh, we are just having some conversations about reliability of technology and high risk. As you'll see, we're having very brief synchronous sessions here that will be recorded. But sometimes synchronous video chats are really high risk technology and not really reliable. We know some people, their internet's coming in and out. Some people don't have enough internet broadband for synchronous meetings like this. So you want to really think about ensuring that your students have access to something, ensuring that it's maybe a, a really low risk, reliable technology. Um, and so just to have those thoughts in mind. And then accessibility is really important to think about upfront. So making sure that whatever you're going to be doing with your students, that it's accessible for everyone. And sometimes that's just a good practice when we're talking about online. All right. So we talked about supporting students briefly. So that's just a little thing to think about those five areas right away, communication, orientation, expectations, technology, and accessibility. Then the second thing that we're gonna talk about today, which I know usually when we're talking with folks from face-to-face -face can be the primary concern on their mind. And that's how we deliver content. This sort of continues the conversation about technology, right? Sometimes we think we're going to just mimic what we do in the face-to-face -face and that we'll just have live video sessions of our lectures or of all of our classes. Um, and again, maybe you don't need to have uh, video chats uh, with your students. And we know from the research that live synchronous video chats don't necessarily work, in particular in large groups if you're expecting everyone to talk and for it to be interactive. So being a communication scholar and from computer media communication, we think a lot about is what is the task? Are you just trying to share some information for with your students? Because maybe thinking video is best because it replicates the face-to-face, -face, it's actually not really the best. We know that text-based or text with images just for basic content delivery, cognitive sorts of things uh, works just fine. Again, there's some resources on the left uh, that support that. We know from means as meta-analysis that text plus images was better for uh, most things when we talk about online delivery than let's say videos. Now, if you have a very complex task, like a process or something you're trying to share with your students, it might require something a little richer. But you need to be thinking about what are you actually trying to accomplish? What type of delivery is best? You wanna go with the low risk sort of leaner one. There's a great theory by Daphne Langle called media richness theory. It's from 1986, but I love using it um, when thinking about content um, because leanness is, is sometimes better. Think about what's available to you, checking with your university or what do you have to go out and secure. Some things are very available to us, like lots of us have PowerPoint um, and we can use PowerPoint to add our notes, you know, add our lecture notes to our PowerPoints and put that online. Maybe we have other sorts of social technologies that are available to us. Um, or do we have to go out and find something? And can we do that in this short time frame? 
And then the other thing is, what skills do I have? So, um, you know, are you an expert at video production? Awesome. I know that I never was, you know, but I'm really good at Word and PowerPoint. So those were a skill set that I had in trying to move my content online. This is a, a great um, dialectical that I've de developed with my colleagues and I incorporated in my book, Social Media for Educators. And again, it will be there for you. But when you're thinking about your content, think about on the left, the leaner of the medium and to the right, the richer of the media, medium. And again, we have a whole session on content, um, but thinking about when you're going to move your content online, focusing more on the leaner, safer, low risk things than just um, trying to have synchronous video for everything is my personal um, and um, the research supports that as well. All right, uh, we talked about supporting um, students and the five areas there. We talked about the four questions to ask yourself when delivering content. Now I'm going to wrap up, which is probably where I would normally start if this was a full three month faculty development program. But I think this is really important. We were talking about experiential learning and George is gonna give a session on that. But sometimes you can just stop and uh, think about what you were gonna do and maybe put that to the side and rethink now what you actually can do now that you are teaching remote. So, um, so I would really strongly recommend, um, and again, there's some resources on the left. Our research showed that design and organization was the number one uh, factor that's gonna influence student outcomes to really think about, um, I love Wiggins and McTeague backwards design. Um, what do you want to accomplish by the end of the term? You know, what do you want your students to be able to do when they leave this class, okay? Then think about what documentation or evidence can they provide to you at a distance to show that they've accomplished this. And then start thinking about, okay, what resources can I provide them, again, remotely, that would provide them the scaffolding that they need in order to produce this documentation or evidence. And so, um, you know, we've talked a lot about this is a great opportunity for experiential learning with the situation that we're in or project-based learning. There's lots of different things that you can now do to transform your course and rethinking the design and how this is gonna move forward. Um, at the end of the day, you just wanna make sure that your students are accomplishing the learning objectives or that they're demonstrating to you these desired results um, and so I think that's really key for us to focus on that um, as we move through this time and thinking about remote teaching. And so um, that is what I have for you. It's a little quick taste of, you know, planning um, to transform your course. Again, um, the five areas of student support, four questions to ask yourself about content. Um, and finally, I'd really encourage you all to just take a day or two and just rethink what do you want your students to be able to accomplish by the end of the semester? Because when you're um, remote teaching, it actually can provide you for an opportunity as well. And I am going to stop this share and I think folks are gonna jump in maybe for some questions and then we'll be turning it over to Matt here shortly. Uh, thanks, uh, Tanya. I haven't seen any questions come in, but if anyone has questions, please, uh, please direct them. One of the things uh, I'll field or quickly throw your way while we're waiting is the experience of teachers moving online. And you touched on it several times that it, it's uh, this isn't a normal setting. You're not going to have the same three month process or even longer that you might have to develop and build that kind of expertise. I think you provide a really nice model that considers some of the key areas and key, critical to that is the fact that it's not only about get your content online or talk at your students. There's an entire sequence of things you need to think about that are more emotional or affective in nature. You need to consider obviously your own space, mental health, especially you may have issues with, with uh, you know, family or, or other concerns that you're facing. Everyone's a little bit higher on the old stress scale, if you will. If you were to assess, suggest teachers then, and you've got a great sort of four point where you're talking about clarity and flexibility and so on, but if you were to suggest to teachers then, in light of the fact that this is not a regular transition online, what mindsets do you think would be most helpful for people to retain as they begin moving online and starting to teach online? Mindsets. 
Well, perspectives, attitudes, um, you know, something along yeah. those lines. Yeah. Well, you know, I think overall we can, you know, this is not a great situation. Um, you're right. We're all just trying to, um, to sort of stay alive, so to speak, every day mentally um, and so forth. Um, sorry, when you say mindset, I get thrown because I just think of my awful, awful growth mindset research and my amazing achievement mindset research, neither of which matter here. <laughs> but someday I would love to talk about those. Um, I think at the end of the day, it sort of goes back to the idea of really for, be forgiving of yourself and forgiving of your students. Make sure to create a supportive environment. We're all in this together, all of us, everyone right now in this Zoom chat, we're here for each other. I think this isn't a time to be rigid um, and to have high expectations or requirements. I think it's really time to sort of uh, reach out and hold hands metaphorically and work with your students in figuring out how you make it through the semester. And I think whatever you do, it'll be fine. So that's about all I have to say about that. <laughs> all right. No, great. I appreciate that. I think you're absolutely right. It is a, a function of uh, sort of self-compassion, almost awareness that you're doing the best you can. Your students are doing the best they can and uh, yeah. things will work out. Now, there's a question that Marta asks here, and one of the things I want to emphasize is in many instances where there are unique domain-specific questions, we may not necessarily have the ability to answer these things for you, but your community will. And so we really emphasize that those of you that have expertise or that have seen a diff different approaches being done, that you respond to one another and address those kinds of questions, whether it's online, on Twitter, or in the discussion forums. But this is an open question, Tanya, uh, for you, Justin, uh, Matt, uh, and I'm not sure, I don't think I see Nagin here currently, but do you have any suggestions on thinking about science labs in an online platform with little time to prepare? So much of the goals are hands-on, so I'm wondering if you have thought about keeping that focus while online. Does anybody want to tackle that one? I can. There were some of us that were just talking about it the last few days. Um, am I on or am I muted? Oh, I am on. Sorry, I'm constantly bad with that. Sorry, guys. So um, it came up with my university was wondering, um, because that was an immediate question that folks had was how do we deal with labs? I know that some people actually are just deciding to not continue with the lab section of the courses or to postpone those for another date. Um, so just to keep that in mind, you know, there is the ability potentially to postpone or to reschedule those to pick up at another time. There is, uh, and I'm just looking for the link right now, there is a resource that folks have been putting together and there's lots of resources that are putting, folks are putting together. Um, but this one was really great. And I should mention Kim Arnold in the Facebook group, Higher Ed and the Coronavirus was asking about this this morning. And so there is an Excel spreadsheet with um, a list of resources that people have been curating that I can share with you for ideas with that. Um, and so, and obviously the other third one is that uh, people are doing a lot of uh, utilizing classroom services and their IT support to help with videoing those, even just from their smartphones and loading those, but it really depends. I mean, lab classes mean a lot. So I'll just share with you that that's what we've been talking about. And I'll post that link as soon as I find it. Excellent. Thanks, uh, Tanya. For, for the rest of you, we mentioned in one of the earlier videos as well that we want to share the best resources we find rather than just create them. So it's sort of a curation creation approach that we've taken where others are uh, involved in trying to pull together resources for discrete activities in online learning and teaching online that we'll be sure to share as we move throughout the course. I don't see any additional questions, so I'm going to pass it over to colleague Matt Crossland. Uh, Matt, I've known him for, I'm guessing, probably over a decade uh, and uh, about seven, eight years at, at UTA. Uh, Matt has a lot of expertise in the experience of learning online and both as, a, as an individual in that environment, but also in teaching and helping faculty move in that environment and also as a faculty member himself in teaching at, remotely or teaching online as well. So he has a broad range of expertise from the learning design process right through the teaching and facilitation process. Matt, over to you. Hello, everyone. Uh, just to uh, go back to that question about labs, also talk to your librarians. 
uh, at your university uh, or if you have those available to you. Uh, often at times at UT, I know we have specific uh, uh, librarians with domain specific knowledge on their uh, side to like the nursing or the science or so on. And so they can help you with some of those uh, resources as well as the uh, Merlot online uh, open educational resource. Uh, it's also um, reserve repository is also a source for those as well. So let me share my screen with that. All right. Okay, so speaking of going lean and speaking of um, focusing on what tasks you want to do, I want to go into a quick example of one way that I've shared through the years as an instructional designer, also as a faculty myself, uh, how to do a very quick, not perfect, not always ideal, but a very uh, a, a effective way to create course content. Um, I say in about an hour or so, if this is the first time you're looking at this, it may take longer, but I found that once you get used to this uh, method that I'm talking about, it does take, uh, it does go a little bit faster. George had asked about mindsets earlier. I did want to talk about the mindsets as well uh, before I get started because these are going to be key and, and, and Tanya also, uh, address that as well, address these as well. So we want to hit these several times because these will be very important to think about. The first one, of course, we've talked about this flexibility for students and for yourself. Usually we hit one or the other, but sometimes we forget either to be flexible with our students or flexible with ourselves. If you're not setting flexible um, uh, assignments and grading standards and stuff for yourself, you're just going to stress yourself out. So. Uh, want people to keep that mindset of flexibility and not just think of that for your students, but also for self-care for yourself. Also, we've talked about care and concern. That's something we just can't emphasize enough. You've got to show your students that you care for them, that you are here for them, that you are not just going to be this rigid person that hands out grades and punitive uh, punishments for not doing everything right. So uh, let them know that you care about them and their life as well and what they're going through as well. Um, accessibility and quality, we've talked about some of those as well. Uh, we need to make sure that we're keeping everything we put online accessible for screen readers. Uh, that's a whole huge area to go into. And also some of the equality measures that we need to take, realizing that not all of our students have access to the same level of internet service, to the same uh, type of computers, or to a computer at all, or to the same space at their house if they have a lot of siblings or family members that are also being forced to stay home well, as well. Uh, another idea of mindset to get into is backup plans for backup plans. Obviously, you can't come up with a lot of those up front, but I've been talking with people about what happens uh, as our, say our internet slows down, as certain services back up, are we you know, ready to go to mailing course materials and those kind of things. But also do some things to save yourself time. Don't be afraid to, and don't beat yourself up if you are doing things that save yourself time, because that's just a lot of times we get into this mindset as, uh, uh, academics that we have to do these very long uh, processes to uh, create our courses and it's okay to save time and I want people to know that here that it's okay to look for things that will save you time there's nothing wrong with doing that so in talking about the the tasks that we need to do uh, when you think about content creation you need to think about how you're going to communicate what you want your students to learn. And this is going back to Michael G. Moore's uh, the types of interaction and online learning back to 1989, or types of, types of interaction and learning, but it also applies to online learning as well. And these have been expanded to at least 12 or more types of interaction in education, but I just want to focus on the three that you'll probably run into the most in online education. The first one being the one-way communication that you're used to. I put some other ideas there just so you can get outside of the of course, it's lectures and textbooks and videos, but there are also other things, articles, blog posts, mail, other things. That's basically going from you or someone else who knows the topic one way to the student. There's also uh, interaction that you can have between uh, instructor and students. We're going to be covering that in future sessions as well, but you can be thinking about these as well. Do you want there to be a discussion rather than a one-way form of communication or a discussion with students communicating with each other? And there are lots of different ways to do that. Uh, again, we're going to go into these more in the future, uh, not just uh, video conferences, but also texting, mobile apps, social media, discussion forums. And so you want to keep those in mind when you're thinking about that content. 
And sometimes some weeks you can just skip to one way stuff and go for the discussion or interaction as well. But as far as creating the content that um, you are, uh, you want the students to learn for the week, here is one time saving option that I like to use and I, I found that it works out fairly well for myself. This is not necessarily something that uh, all faculty like because um, that they have to give up kind of the control and the center and being the one expert in the course, but other faculty like it a lot as well. So, and that is uh, instead of sitting there trying to record videos yourself and sitting there trying to type up a lot of stuff yourself, do a quick 15 to 30 minute search on the web and find other resources, the people that have already created the content that you want to teach for you. This could be at your school library database, uh, on other blogs, articles and stuff. Take about 15 to 30 minutes to do that. Maybe a little bit longer if you're kind of a bit new to this. You know, look for your bookmarks, even if you've bookmarked on your browser and see uh, if you've saved anything from the past that might be helpful as well. And then create a page of content in your learning management system or on a blog or some other website that you're used to that lists these sources you find and then type out some of your notes about why you uh, pick those. Come up with stuff that, um, that you know, maybe a little bit different from your perspective. Think about different social cultural contexts or other countries uh, outside of the United States as well that might have some different perspectives that you could put in there as well. Don't also forget that if you have a textbook, there's that one, or there's also open educational resources uh, repositories like Merlot as well. And if you put these together in place of your lecture, again, this is kind of going uh, lean on the content, but um, it also kind of focuses on the task of what you want to communicate with them. You can come up with some content in a pretty quick manner. And once you start doing this a few times, you do find that it goes faster and faster. And you start saving up uh, links that. And then even beyond that, another idea that I share is have your students search for these sources and share with each other. You don't always have to be the one that finds everything for your students. Um, Think about ways that they could find content, not just only online, but also around their house. Do they have books around the house? We know, I know a lot of libraries are closing, but um, if they have access to uh, other sources of information, maybe calling up family members, things like that. Uh, have students search for content sources and then share with each other, and then you can collect those. Um, if it's not perfect, don't forget the overall mindset of flexibility on this. Be okay if you don't get to cover every single point that you would like to cover in a normal class situation. It's okay. So the other thing that you'll want to do in creating uh, content for your course is looking at activity creation. Some kind of uh, something to do with the content. You don't necessarily, uh, we need to be careful that we don't have uh, all these students staring at videos and taking quizzes and tests all day. We've already heard out of Italy about the students there that are complaining about having to log on to a school every day and just sit there for three hours with a video every single day. And how they're getting very tired of that and wish they could go back to the way school was. So keep that in mind. Um, and they're also gonna get very tired of taking tests and quizzes. I uh, said so think outside the multiple choice box because they're gonna get very tired of taking those multiple choice quizzes as well. So think of what activities you can think of that will give them applying what they learned to problems and to experiences. We've talked about, uh, Tanya mentioned experiential learning. There's also problem-based learning. These are all research-based ideas uh, that have been proven very effective if, if you um, utilize these in place of tests and quizzes like that. Um, and even more importantly, like I said, think of what they can do off the computer around the house. Think of some art projects, some, uh, you know, some kind of maybe discussion they could have with family members about an issue, some of that. Even in place of labs, think about how they could dig into problems. This is an idea that uh, Tanya shared many times, is think about ways that they can think about the problem of the coronavirus and how it applies to your topic and, and how they can uh, do some problem-based uh, solutions around that as well. But if you think about something that they can work on, that will take maybe even multiple works to, uh, excuse me, multiple weeks to complete, where they do this part of it this week, this part of it next week, then another part of it three weeks from now. Uh, this will also be something that they can continue working on and can continue keeping them uh, uh, thinking through topics uh, that relate to your course.
And again, um, I think I've covered some of this. If you do, but if you do need a quiz, I usually recommend that you just do a five to ten quick question, uh, understanding check. Uh, the high stakes testing is really going to stress people out like this, and with you have to start getting into proctoring and lockdown browsers, and people don't necessarily have good enough technology for that sometimes at home. So if you really want to get into quizzes, I recommend a five to ten question understanding check with unlimited attempts, no trick questions. Just something that just lets them know this is what I wanted you to learn this week, and they can just take as many times as they want to. Uh, some things like this can actually help reassure some students that they are learning what you want them to learn because it's, uh, you're saying these five questions are the, the five big things I wanted you to get this week. Um, but in place of that, I also we were I was just talking about the problem-based learning, and I think I was just tired, and I put a repeat slide in here because I kept deleting the last one over and over again for some reason. But um, this one is um, just putting some kind of uh, thoughts on how you would uh, create this activity. Just think of something that allows learners to apply the course content to their real lives, to real world problems, current issues, et cetera. Even in place of a lab, like I said, this could take you 15 to 20 minutes to come up with that. Uh, and then maybe even let students think of how they will communicate what they've learned. Do they just uh, give them something other than just, um, uh, you know, just the option of come turning a paper. Let them think through how they want to prove to you. Let them get creative about what they want to do as well. And then spend some time thinking through instructions and maybe even give some examples of some creative ways to do this. Spend 15 to 30 minutes on doing that. I like to say that if you're only spending about five minutes on the instructions, you're probably not clearly communicating what the students should do. If you start spending more than say 15 to 30 minutes on the instructions, you may be just making it overly complex. So but remember in all of this, uh, again, the flexibility, remember the accessibility, uh, are you keeping these content activities accessible? And then remember also the quality issues, think about who your students are, where they may be on lock, you know, locked down in their house, what they have accessible to them in that house as well. So uh, I've also put some time-saving video options. If you are going to go use some video, I think it's okay to have a few minutes of video each week, even though uh, it, it can be a bit um, time-consuming to produce, but just keep that time-consuming. The fact that it does take time to create the video and have the accessible captions. There are um, Auto captioning tools are out there, but they are not 100% correct. And you, in order for accessibility compliance, you do have to make sure they are fully correct. So I put some options up there. Uh, we know from research you want to keep these videos under five minutes uh, because uh, students start losing focus after two to three minutes, really. Um, definitely after five minutes. But option one, record your video, upload it for option caps, auto captioning, and then edit for errors. That does take a lot longer than people realize. I do have to point that out. Uh, but it is probably the best option for getting everything in there quickly. Uh, a lot of times people, uh, though, are worried about reading from a script because they think it makes them sound stiff. But again, if you're doing this online in a hurry, you may just have to worry about, you just have to do the option two there. Type out your content, read from the page, and don't worry about if it makes you look stiff. Just do it that way. And then you have your script on your page as your transcript. Another option if you have a bit more time is you can record your video just talking normally like you would to sound natural. Upload it to YouTube or something else that has auto captions. Download the auto captions. Edit for mistakes and rabbit trails and other things that you want out of there. And then, re and then read that script recording again. This will give you the natural kind of feel and flow that you had from just talking naturally, but then it will also edit out the mistakes that you usually make when you're talking off the cuff. And that one actually came from our video uh, media specialist that we used to have at UTA, Britt Benham. He gave us that uh, tip right there and it's worked out really well for a lot of our faculty. All this I just said comes from a blog post that I posted a few weeks ago. This is in our classes. We put this link in there. It's also in the slides as well. I kind of go through this in a bit more detail in there as well. So you can look at that blog post for more details. And that is kind of the quick rundown of that. All right. Uh, thanks very much, uh, Matt. I'm uh, certainly a very uh, solid, uh, user-informed set of guidelines for people to reflect on as they begin making the change to the online setting. Uh, one of the things that really came through in your presentation is just the scope and the degree to which you have a range of options that are contextually dependent, meaning 
you know, you may want to do video, but video may work now and we may find a week down the road as everybody starts going online and using Zoom that it becomes a, an untenable platform and we now need to shift to something like an email listserv. And so that flexibility and that adaptation is critical in uh, being flexible with your mindsets as you move online. And then of course, recognizing just the range of media options that you have available. Many of these are free, uh, free tools that you can access. If you have, for example, one of the newer uh, iPads with the, the Apple Pencil effect going on, it's a, if you teach math, for example, you can take something like Zoom, do a screen board, uh, you know, share uh, the screen and actually do all of your, your uh, instructions just directly on that whiteboard in sharing in terms of that approach. There's a range of other approaches, very simple techniques that chances are the problem that you may be facing someone has resolved in the digital learning environment because as we've shared several times early on this isn't ground zero this is 30 40 50 60 years of research that goes back to and even longer in some cases right from distance education to early computer-based training to uh, e-learning to web 2.0 to now much richer online environment so there's a lot of problems that have been solved. And this is one of the benefits we want to really promote you to ask your questions in the edX discussion environment so that you can activate the wisdom and the knowledge that exists within the group. With your experience moving stuff online, Matt, and I don't see any questions forthcoming, so I'll quickly throw one your way. With your experience in moving content online, uh, what do you think should be sort of a bare minimum that instructors or teachers should be thinking about? You've talked quite a bit about some of the tools and the approaches, uh, but maybe you could flesh out a little bit more in terms of uh, some of the focus on interaction, the focus on engagement and so on. Uh, the bare minimum, I think, is what we've been talking about, uh, especially Tanya talked about earlier, uh, with uh, communicating with your students and keeping them the center of everything that's happened. We, we talk a lot about student-centered learning and then uh, we kind of a lot of times people will halfway implement it but still keep a lot of control for themselves and a lot of dictating to students what they need to do uh, in a lot of instances. So uh, I think the bare minimum is uh, realizing that that student is now out of your classroom, they're now out of the school environment, they are now kind of an independent autonomous learner and and you need to tap into that autonomy uh, as much as possible instead of trying to control them from a distance so it's, again it goes into that flexibility and it goes into um, the um, uh, not uh, not being too tough on yourself not being too tough on them as well uh, if, if they don't get everything perfect as well um, so I don't know if that's what you're looking for but uh, that, those are kind of the mindsets I keep on wanting to harp on is, uh, is that flexibility. All right, great. No, oh, thank you. So there's a lot of expertise with the group here. I do want to just say a quick shout out, obviously. I think I may have mentioned this, uh, forgot to mention this at the start, but uh, we have uh, uh, Tanya, who represents the uh, University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee uh, system. We have Matt, Justin, and myself, who represent UT Arlington, and we have Nagan and myself, uh, who also represent um, University of South Australia. So there's some uh, expertise that you're going to hear from our experiences, but we also have a number of interviews and resources lined up that are going to do a deeper dive on these different topics from the lens of different people who either have exceptional expertise in the practice of it and others who have done some of the world leading research over the last 30 years around engaging in digital environments. Now there's a question here which is what is the research say about students video showing during class? Now I'm assuming if I interpret this correctly Steph please redirect but that you mean students showing their videos while they're attending a lecture or um, are you referring to just video demonstrations such, such as let's say Matt and Tanya are doing uh, during your lecture if you could just clarify a bit and so either of you Tanya and Matt you may want to tackle it just from either perspective while we're waiting for the response yeah well the research actually shows that synchronous meetings of that size the students don't like them um, and so um, and they don't have a positive impact on grades. So I guess it depends on the activity that they're doing. If they're just coming to a class, 30 students to listen to the faculty member talk, 
it's probably better for the faculty member to just write those up or record in segments what that person needs to say and post them online in shorter segments. The students do like video, but when they like video, they like it to usually be OER or they like it to be shorter, richer clips that are specific to certain concepts or processes that they're learning. I've also That's heard right. a lot of people. Oh, sorry, I've heard a lot of people sharing that uh, some of your auto captioning uh, services start breaking down if you have more than uh, say four people in Zoom. Uh, so you do run into accessibility issues. Uh, you know, uh, and if you are talking about having students create a video and sharing with each other. Again, that's another source that can go to the web and have students create their own website, their own blog, and then post their work there. Uh, they can even password protect it if they need to, if there's if something they want to, you know, keep a little bit more private as well, or even just uh, email the professor as well. And then you can also do things, uh, I know a lot of people with, uh, um, like uh, the DSO, DS106 crew have uh, worked on blog hubs, pulling together these different blogs that students work on and in different websites and pulling together into one centralized place where all of their blog posts are pulled in there so you can see all their videos. As well as you're using something like YouTube and they upload their videos to YouTube and you can create a playlist on YouTube and just watch each other's videos and they have time as well. And other people use things like Flipgrid, but I believe that costs money, but it works well as well. So there are other ways to do that as well. What about the question? So there's a, a, a Steph, I think the question that's being asked is, what if it's an interactive class? You have 30 people and it's an engaged classroom in a discussion. And you know, how, how does that address uh, that experience? So context is everything, meaning bandwidth is a factor. Does everybody have a webcam? Are you excluding people who might not have a webcam? Uh, some people may feel uncomfortable when they first try and interact visually in this environment. One of the things that we do discuss early on, as I mentioned in the, in the quick, uh, recording around the course introduction is we want to provide a few frameworks, not an overwhelming amount, but ones that can give you good guidance. So there is a concept of social presence that we use from a community of inquiry framework that references the value of knowing that people are there, so to speak, and that there's some level of connectedness to other people. Video can certainly impact that. So if you have, but if you have a group of 30 people and everybody has their video on, it's really hard following what's going on. It's one thing to have as a student is presenting to have them have their video on. I think that that makes good sense because for many of you, you might be listening to this in the background while you're doing email. Some of you may actually uh, be looking at the screen and seeing a face does make that a slightly richer experience. But so from the, the, uh, this, the, the social presence angle, video can be helpful. There are a number of dynamics that that make it difficult, especially if let's say you have a group that doesn't have a lot of cohesion and doesn't hasn't have spent a lot of time connecting and collaborating. You may find this like pulling teeth, meaning you're constantly asking, okay, what do you think? What do you, and you're just trying to drive conversation. On the other hand, if it's a class, some of you have already been teaching in person, you found them to already be very engaged. They know one another. That's different because now we're talking about a an existing set of social relationships and you often find this there's some work one of the people I interviewed yesterday Maha Bali that will share uh, her her recording with shortly. Uh, she recently ran uh, sort of a session relating to how many people are paying attention to this transition to digital learning. And it was just a group of experts, they know one another. They've, they've been working together for many years and, and you, that video adds just a richer dimension to an almost a kind of a homecoming effect. So what I'm trying to get at with that is there are a range of issues around bandwidth, accessibility, technology access, comfort, familiarity. Those are contextually implemented, meaning if it's a group of students who know one another already from an existing physical course, you'll likely have a quicker on-ramp to people being able to connect with one another because there's some existing social cohesion. If you're starting cold, it can be a bit abrupt and a bit confronting. But again, we do use the social presence approach from the community of inquiry model. A few other comments in the chat area. Um, I think the, you know, from uh, Autumn mentioned that these experiences can be asynchronous. So I just want to clarify this again, because some of you may not be familiar with the terminology. One of the things that's interesting within the ed tech space is we use terminology from, say, the psychology of learning through to the process of education due to uh, a number of the technology terms. So unless you sit at that intersection half of the time, there's a lot of jargony words. Synchronous basically is what we're doing now. For those of you that are 
watching this live. Uh, it's, it's sort of real-time interaction. Asynchronous is what you might find in a discussion forum on a blog post. It might be that you do a quick video recording, your students come by with a quick video response as well in different settings. So it's really uh, a, a time-based kind of a separation in, in terms of defining that uh, curriculum. Uh, don't see any other questions. Uh, Tanya, Matt, final comments? I think that people will have tons of questions and I think there's lots of resources out there. Please feel free to reach out to us and there is opportunities for you to have conversations asynchronously, not in real time, um, every day, all hours of the day. So please feel free to take advantage of that. Yeah, we have this course. I mean, hopefully some of you students can experiment with some of these. You can go into the discussion forums. Um, edX's uh, interface is a, is a little bit different than Canvas or Blackboard or other ones, but it still has the same basic idea of being able to post questions and then people follow up uh, uh, hours or even days later, as well as also the Twitter hashtag as well. And we'll, we'll you know, be trying to pay attention to both of those as well so you can see kind of how these uh, asynchronous uh, discussions can happen over time as well so that as uh, at the point that uh, uh, Marta brought up about the synchronous sessions uh, can create an inequality because the students that don't make it yeah they can watch the recording later but they can't ask questions of a recording uh, maybe someday AI will figure that out who knows but as of right now you can't ask the question of a, of a recording so uh, it does create a little bit of a, well, a, a pretty big inequality so we can um, so, you know, as much as possible, I would recommend thinking through those inequalities, and that's a good way to do that, is asking these questions, will all students have equal access to the same resources if I do it this way? Well, I think on that note, we encourage you to just start engaging, asking your questions. Tanya made a really good point uh, early on as we start our planning. And, and just to be clear, we're going through the same process all of you are going through. The idea of this course started about a week ago. edX was quick to respond to get it online. Tanya, Matt, Justin, and Negan all sort of, you know, we all dove in and just started pulling things together. So we are experiencing what all of you are experiencing. And we are very reflective of uh, your uh, opinions, meaning Tanya suggested, look, because we're pulling things together at this pace, if there's a lot of interest in topic X, we can bring that in. And so if you have questions or concerns or issues that you are struggling with, drop them in to the, either the Q and A in edX or uh, tweet them out or however you want to get a hold of us. Uh, certainly our e email us as well, share information with us. So I just want to be clear that the structure of this environment is going to enable us to be quite responsive to your actual experience. A key point to return to as we wrap up, we'll keep promoting research lens, we'll be pulling together bibliographies on this, we'll be sharing practices that experts that are teaching in this environment extensively utilize. And we hope that this will end up for you being seen as a bit of a, a support infrastructure where there's some scaffolded guidance as you try to make the transition to teaching online. And those of you that are supporting others who are teaching online, like it's not just the teachers. There's many of you who are learning designers or instructional designers who are now uh, fielding just a ridiculous amount of requests. And, and that no doubt has its own level of being overwhelmed. So there is that entire support infrastructure that we want to be attentive to as well. All right. Thanks everyone. Matt, Tanya, great stuff today. Looking forward to our chat tomorrow. We're doing the same time every day this week and we'll uh, hopefully see many of you here. Take care.